Hello, my name is Andy Pickard. I represent Rolls-Royce on the Incosi Corporate Advisory Board, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 45th Incosi webinar. This month's webinar is by Rick Derb, We will give a presentation on Agile Systems and Processes, Necessary and Sufficient Fundamental Architecture. Before Rick begins, I just want to say a few words about the webinar program. The Incosi webinar program series came about because of a request from the Corporate Advisory Board at the 2008 International Workshop to provide a way for members to get current information on a regular basis. We will provide both current technical topics as well as help people understand how to get the most out of Incosi. At the end of this webinar, I'll go over the upcoming schedule. Rick Dove was co-principal investigator on the original work which identified agility as the next competitive differentiator, funded by the U.S. Office of the Secretary of Defense through the Navy in 1991 at Lehigh University. He went on to organize and lead the U.S. DARPA-funded industry collaborative research at Lehigh University's Agility Forum, developing fundamental understandings of what enables and characterizes systems agility. He authored Response, Ability, the Language, Structure, and Culture of the Agile Enterprise. He has employed these Agile concepts in both the architecture and program management and for large enterprise IT systems, for rapid manufacturing systems and services, and for highly distributed resilient network anomaly detection. Through Stevens Institute of Technology, he teaches two 40-hour graduate courses in basic and advanced agile systems engineering and agile systems engineering at client sites. Independently through his own com company, Paradigm Shift International, he ch chairs the working group on system security engineering with projects to compile self-organizing agile security patterns and initiatives to place responsibility for system security on systems engineering. And he chairs the newly formed working group for agile systems and systems engineering. Rick, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Andy. Uh, I noticed there are a lot of uh, attendees who are callers only, uh, which means they won't be able to see the presentation. And, and the only thing I want to let callers only oh. understand is that it is a highly graphic presentation. Yeah. Uh, Rick, don't, don't worry about that. It, it shows callers and uh, people who are attending on the uh, uh, by IT separately. So, in fact, yeah, they, they match. Okay. Everyone who can see can hear, and who can hear can see. Okay. Okay. Uh, this first slide that I'm showing here basically says that they're they're uh, this this uh, slide set. Uh, is perpetually updated. It is a it is a general webinar that I provide uh, periodically uh, in various forums, and so there is an email at, at a, a web address there that will allow you to get the latest version, uh, should you care to. Uh, okay, so my my objective is to present Agile systems from an architectural point of view in such a way that that uh, you can see the bones, the connective tissue uh, that architecturally that uh, allows, enables a system to be agile. And so it is, it is a view of systems that is uh, often not presented in other forums. So the content of today's presentation, I will, I will begin with some background. Uh, basically the origins of this whole concept of Agile systems and Agile process thinking. Uh, then I will illustrate uh, the fundamental concepts with a series of cases. Uh, home entertainment system uh, leads, leads the uh, agenda here principally because it is something uh, everybody has one of, I presume. Uh, and has some understandings over many years of how these things operate and work. And so we'll look at how the fundamentals manifest there, and, and then we'll look in a number of very specific areas. Some of the things I will show are what I will call Agile systems, and some of what I will show are what I will call Agile processes. Uh, however, from a, from a uh, 
at least from my point of view. Systems uh, processes are just an, an instance of, of systems. Uh, okay, and, and uh, assuming we have time, I mean, normally uh, this presentation is more like a 60-minute presentation. Andy's uh, basically indicated that it'll be uh, more like 45 minutes here. Uh, as a result, uh, some of the latter end on precedence there I may skip over. Uh, but basically it says that the fundamentals I show you from, from observed systems uh, that were man-made are echoed in uh, biological systems and other kinds of natural self-organizing systems. Uh, the other thing to note here is that uh, often when, when uh, this material is presented, it is presented as a one-hour uh, predecessor to a series of exercises that help the people who uh, are exposed to the material here uh, actually employ some of it. Uh, we won't, of course, be able to do that here. Okay, so today's interest in agility uh, basically got its origin in 1991. Uh, it, was, it was instigated uh, by the Japanese uh, demonstrated uh, new technique and superior capability in manufacturing which has now come under the, the term of lean manufacturing. And uh, somebody in the, in the, uh, in the uh, defense secretary's office basically said, okay, enough people are trying to figure out what the heck lean means. Uh, let's get a project going that figures out what's next uh, so that we can leapfrog instead of just playing catch up here. And that resulted in a project at Lehigh University uh, with 13 companies that, that more or less were a cross-section of in different industrial section, uh, sectors. Some were defense manufacturers, some were auto manufacturers, some were telecommunications people, some were semiconductor people, and some were process people. So we tried to get a cross-section, uh, and, and uh, what we asked for, from these representatives or the companies we went to uh, we said, send us somebody who's got breadth and depth uh, in enterprise and manufacturing understandings and someone who is, in fact, gainfully employed and you're not trying to park them with us uh, as, as they count down the days to retirement. And they have to have influence in the corporation. We had to send a few back uh, and get replacements for them, but basically we ended up with a good group of people. Uh, published a two-volume report. It's available on uh, Amazon. Uh, it was manufacturing enterprise focused back in those days because all of this was in response to the lean manufacturing concepts that were coming out of, out of Japan. Uh, 92, right after we put that report together, people said, okay, so, so Agile sounds nice, but how the heck do you get Agile? Uh, how do you build Agile systems? Uh, and so uh, a bunch of people basically volunteered with a little bit of funding from two of the uh, 13 companies that had been involved to build a forum where we could investigate those things. And we did that on a volunteer basis until DARPA came along in 94 and said, okay, let's get let's give some legs to this thing and funded uh, an activity that allowed us to get uh, over 250 organizations, over 1,000 participants meeting multiple times per year in specific focus areas on Agile something. Uh, mission uh, was basically accomplished in 1998, a little bit earlier than the five years that, that DARPA had initially said they would fund. Uh, and it was declared accomplished for two reasons. One, we had infected a lot of people with an interest in Agile concepts and Agile enterprise. And that was the principal mission, uh, to get this thing self-running thereafter. Uh, it was also that uh, DARPA had decided that instead of spending all $25 million, they'd rather spend some of it somewhere else and, and uh, cease funding since it looked like we had uh, succeeded in getting the concepts across. Since then, I have basically spent uh, the rest of my endeavors in trying to figure out uh, more depth and understanding on fundamentals and also uh, taking those into the field and developing systems that, that uh, follow these. And you're going to see the results of that here. Uh, so the, the uh, research focus 
uh, at the Agility Forum it was basically to deal with the problems of, of fast-changing technologies and markets uh, and shorter and shorter life cycles uh, in unpredictable, uncertain environments, uh, and a realization that, that flexible approaches, which had been uh, more or less the kind of an answer people would take into these spaces earlier, was no longer adequate, uh, and that a new approach was needed. And what we did was basically examine hundreds of different kinds of systems uh, that, that somebody claimed, well, this thing appears to have that ability to deal in an uncertain environment effectively. Why don't you come out and look at, at what we're doing or what's going on with this system? And what we were attempting to do in, in examining these systems was, was find out what is the common core at a very fundamental principled level that allows them to deal effectively in an uncertain environment and build a response very rapidly to something that hadn't been anticipated previously. And of course, we were also looking for uh, what does effective mean uh, in response? How do you measure it? Uh, are there different types of response capabilities that would be of interest? And what are fundamental principles? And, and uh, fundamentally, this is, this is uh, where we came. Uh, after examining many systems, uh, an effective response in an uncertain environment is timely, and that means it's fast enough to deliver a value. Uh, it's affordable, which means if you have to respond more than once during a year to an unexpected activity, uh, you haven't squandered all your money on, on uh, being able to deal with one only. So it's affordable, which means it doesn't cost you a lot to, to uh, develop a new response. It's predictable, which is to say it could be counted on to meet expectations. That's a, that's a quality uh, measure in your ability to respond in an uncertain environment. And it's comprehensive, which means uh, it, if your need to respond within mission uh, may have a fairly large span, uh, we're not talking about uh, you can respond in scope 10% different than what you were doing before. We're saying you can respond anywhere within mission. There's a variety of ways to think of, of uh, agility, requisite variety. Some people like risk management, proactive risk management. Some people like uh, it's uh, an innovative response in unpredictable situations. It's a life cycle extension. There are, I'm sure, other ways to think about this. But the trick is to understand what enables the ability to reconfigure uh, a system slash process when the situation changes and something different is required. Lean and Agile, uh, we were back in, in the early 90s. Uh, trying to come up with a with a uh, understanding that was different than lean, and so people said, "Well, what you know, what's the difference? What is difference here?" And the difference was one of focus. Uh, lean was focused on uh, process and system operation, uh, highly efficient, you know, good efficiency and system operation, whereas agile was focused on process and system transformation. Uh, and that's to say they are uh, orthogonal. Uh, they can be very complementary, uh, but they can also be at odds with each other. And uh, in order to mix the two effectively, there needs to be good understanding of, of uh, uh, what is the priority for efficient operation versus uh, ease of process transformation. And that's all dependent upon the requirements uh, of the system in its environment. Within the Agile system environment, uh, I, I carve it up into two classes. Uh, one class is reconfigurable, the other is reconfiguring. And the difference basically being uh, one has a lot of manual operation in it. Uh, it's highly reconfigurable, but somebody has to do that, whereas the other is more systemic in terms of its reconfiguring activity. And the extreme, of course, is in the natural systems environment. We won't be we won't be looking at those 
uh, in this presentation. We'll be looking at class one systems. Uh, in the in the courses that we teach, uh, in, in the uh, in the basic and advanced courses that we teach in agile systems, uh, there are seven thought guiding frameworks that we teach the students uh, to help them get their uh, thinking processes uh, organized, and, and these are those seven. Uh, and basically today we're going to look at the more fundamental ones as opposed to the, the ones that help you deal with the fundamentals more. So we're really, we're really looking at architecture and the key issues of architecture. Uh, and uh, two of the ten key principles, encapsulated modules, and evolving minimal standards. And we'll see what all that means shortly. But for a, a graphic representation of the architecture uh, and for a metaphorical understanding, uh, I'll start with the hackneyed phrase, drag and drop, plug and play. Uh, and we'll, we'll see more of, of how that plays out uh, in terms beyond just those words as we go through this this uh, webinar, but uh, we start with the with the concept that we have a bunch. You know, we want a bunch of modules. They have to be encapsulated modules, and we'll talk about that uh, some number of slides from now about what distinguishes encapsulated modules. Uh, but here's a home entertainment uh, environment, and there are all kinds of brands of amplifiers you can buy, all kinds of speakers brands, all kind of signal tuners, so on and so forth, in terms of the kinds of modules that you can buy to configure a home entertainment system. Uh, some of these are uh, things that have only come uh, into being recently. Some of them have been around for 50 plus years. Uh, but there is this concept from an architectural point of view of modules uh, and, and I'll say pools of similar type modules. Uh, which can be assembled by somebody uh, into uh, usable systems, configured systems. Uh, audio tape, you know, I, I've basically shown a, a timeline here a bit of three di different types of systems. Audio tape, I mean, I can remember reel-to-reel -reel audio tape hooked up to an amplifier as being the home entertainment system 50 years ago. Uh, Interestingly enough, that 50-year-old or 70-year-old or audio tape reel-to-reel -reel, can still be plugged into today's environment. Uh, more recently, we've had uh, video media uh, with television, uh, uh, CD and DVD brought into the environment. And very recently, we have uh, some TiVo and peer-to-peer -peer and net uh, network input-output connections. So, these are examples of typical reconfigurable, scalable system configurations. Uh, and you can drag and drop those encapsulated modules into the configuration of choice today uh, because there is an infrastructure, which I'll call a passive infrastructure, consisting of rules, standards, principles, that allow all of these different devices to actually be plugged into each other and, and work. Uh, and here I've shown uh, you know, a time frame uh, more or less uh, demarcating those three system examples there. And I've shown how the infrastructure over time has had to change uh, in order to accommodate video surround and then uh, eventually uh, digital internet. But the interesting thing is through those changes, uh, nothing uh, in general uh, was disallowed. Uh, you know, everything proceeded forward. Yes, we had we had uh, we had various formats of of CD, DVD, and and uh, video cassette uh, that had their battles and and lost them, uh, and some won. But basically, uh, those concepts. Uh, have accidentally presented themselves as a very agile home entertainment system. Nobody sat down 60 years ago and said, you know, we have to look forward for 100 years here and make sure that people who buy things don't have them become obsolete. 
Okay, so another part of the infrastructure, which is extremely important, is what I call the active infrastructure. And the active infrastructure basically names, very specifically, responsible parties for four specific activities that have to go on constantly, 24-7. That doesn't mean that somebody is always doing something, but somebody is always available to deal with an issue that has to be dealt with in the active infrastructure. And one of the key ones is, is who does the assembly? Who grabs the modules that are available and decides how to configure a system? And in a home entertainment business, that's us. That's the user, the owner of the system. You know, and, and, uh, I don't know about you, but I reconfigure my systems at home here frequently depending upon whether I'm having an outdoor barbecue party and have to pull something out there from the home entertainment system uh, only some parts of which have to go and others which don't have to. Uh, you know, and I upgrade periodically. Then there's uh, somebody responsible for the uh, availability of usable modules. You want to you wanna update uh, the DVD system that you have. Uh, or you want one of these big cassette units that holds a hundred different CDs in it uh, instead of this this five CD version. Uh, there's got to be some place you can go get that right now, right now. And in this case, the readiness of availability is managed by the retail outlets, the stores, the places, or the Internet, wherever it is that you would go to get one of these things. But somebody, uh, and in this case, it's a multiple community of stores in competition with each other that does that. Uh, then there's the issue of module mix. Uh, what exactly is potentially available? The stores, in this case, have to make them available. Uh, on on an as-needed basis, but somebody has to decide what can the stores carry in this case. So we refer to that as module mix, and in this case, it's it's the manufacturers. Uh, all of this works very well with loose groups like manufacturers and stores because of a very strong competitive environment. And and we'll see this play out differently in different system environments. Okay, and then finally very key important thing is the evolution of the infrastructure. Uh, somewhere, decisions are made that says, okay, you know, the future requires that something new be added into our, our established set of rules, standards, and principles. And somebody's responsible for that. In this case, uh, home entertainment industry, it's the industry associations that, that uh, decide what those new standards are. Okay, so uh, the fundamental concept of the architectural concept diagram basically has uh, encapsulated modules of various types and pools. It has uh, a evolving passive infrastructure that shows how those modules can be uh, interconnected and interplay. It has an active infrastructure of people who sustain the agility of these systems. And, uh, you know, the, the uh, type 1, 2, 3 depiction there of various configurations isn't really part of the fundamental architecture. It's a way of communicating uh, a variety of ranges to people. Okay, so now we'll move into a case, uh, which I'll call a system case as opposed to a process case, of aircraft refurb for quick reaction capability. Uh, this was actually a master's project uh, done at L3 Communications. Uh, and what they do is, is uh, a large variety and volume of refurbing uh, military and other aircraft with electronic equipment. And, you know, the Department of Defense basically says, uh, I got this aircraft that's now got a new mission in a new place in geography and needs new technology installed in it, and we won it yesterday. And the way quick reaction capability, for the most part, is handled by any company uh, servicing Department of Defense or other environments is uh, overtime and relaxed rules, processes, and quality. Uh, and so one of the things I charge my students with at L3 is to think about quick reaction and decide if they want that to be their master's project and figure out how to actually build a system 
that has the C part, the capability part, uh, employed. So a couple of examples. Uh, Jason Boss, who, who did this work, was basically uh, responsible principally for uh, heating, ventilating, heating, ventilation, cooling, uh, and power distribution within these aircraft. And when you bring a new, when you bring a in-use aircraft. Uh, down for refurb of its internals, uh, a heck of a lot of activity goes on in rewiring and replumbing uh, heating and, ven and, and ventilation throughout here. And so Jason tried to attack, how, how can I reduce the amount of effort that has to go in to a refurb job? And uh, basically took some of the principles from the, from the uh, Agile area and said, okay, if I can get, instead of having to uh, put new boxes in this uh, aircraft and wire from the central power area to every single box, uh, which is a major, a major time-consuming and, and uh, effortful process, uh, what if I could just send uh, one power uh, connection to a rack and let the rack uh, independently distribute throughout? And, and he came up with a process and a technology that could do that. Okay, so the rack becomes an encapsulated module, uh, and the power infrastructure is minimized. Same thing in the in the cooling. Uh, instead of instead of rerouting uh, cooling plenums and, and uh, cooling ducts uh, for everything new that you stuck into this aircraft, uh, because what was there before. Uh, couldn't handle the heat load that is now there with the new equipment. Uh, he figured out how to build a rack mechanism that could stake a standard one-size-fits-all uh, cooling system uh, over to each of the racks and then customize within that rack uh, how much cooling was applied at what part in the rack to where the heat was being generated. Uh, again, uh, it allows the rack to be an encapsulated module, and the cooling infrastructure is minimized. Uh, okay, so he has concepts of boxes that the Department of Defense says, uh, here's, here's a, a variety of different instruments that I want uh, put into the aircraft. Uh, zones uh, in his racks that are standardized, and racks that are standardized, and a set of, uh, on the bottom, uh, uh, infrastructure standards that govern uh, the way things can be connected and interconnected. And put into the diagram, this is, this is how it ends up. And he's, he's able to name who's responsible for those responsibilities. Uh, and he's got three different varieties of, of uh, common types of systems they're called upon to deal with and a very minimal set of, of standards. Okay. Now we'll move into a different space. This is, this is uh, project management. And uh, it's called the last planner system. And I highly recommend this for anybody who's interested in project management concepts. Uh, Ballard, uh, who, did, who did this work himself, and is, he started with his PhD thesis and uh, has gone on to infect many people. Uh, in these concepts is basically focused on construction projects, large, you know, 50-story buildings, things like that. Uh, and and he refers to uh, his approach as a very lean system. And uh, I can understand why he did because he's he's got a lot of lean concepts going on in this last planner system. But when I look at the essence of the last planner system, what he's dealing with is how to deal with uncertainty in the construction environment. And, in, and the uncertainty there uh, is fundamentally, uh, well, the two before if we wanted today didn't show up today. Or uh, the crew that we were going to put on this job that's on the master schedule today is still busy doing the last job, and they're not available. Uh, so those are the kinds of things uh, that, the, that the construction environment has to deal with. Uh, they did a little bit of study in advance to, to set some benchmarks uh, on how things are done now so that if they had new ideas on how things ought to be done, uh, they could actually uh, get some idea uh, 
partly uh, what to attack uh, and also what to measure. And one of the key things uh, that Ballard uh, dealt with in this whole last planner, oh, the last planner, the reason it's called the last planner is because there's a variety of planning activities that go on in any major project like this. And the last planner is that poor guy who says, what are we going to do today? And he's the guy that has to deal with the fact that the master schedule, which was done by the first planner, uh, doesn't make any sense today because the requisite uh, requirements for what you need to complete a task that the master schedule says should start today isn't there. So the last planner uh, really deals with how do you give this poor guy who's got to decide what to do now uh, options so that he always has something to do. He can always keep his crews busy. That's another problem in this environment where, you know, you've got people scheduled and, and they can't do anything today. Uh, so one of the things that Ballard is focused on uh, is, is this concept of how do you figure out what's really available to do today and he deals with uh, tasks, and uh, tasks in order to be qualified for eligible work today uh, have to have these, these uh, soundness, sequence, size, uh, learning, definition, uh, qualities associated with them that are managed uh, in, an in a project environment. Okay, so rule one, allow scheduled activities to remain in the master schedule unless positive knowledge exists that the activity should or cannot be executed when scheduled. Should not or cannot be. <laughs> I'm not going to read all these slides to you, but his, his fundamental uh, mechanism is a look-ahead window that says anything on the master schedule that uh, is within six weeks of, of supposedly starting uh, needs to come under close scrutiny, and we will scrutinize everything on, on a week-by-week -week basis starting at its six weeks to, to kickoff time, uh, and we'll make sure that all of the uh, materials needed, crews needed, resources needed, uh, are in fact expedited to make sure that they are available so that by the time something is one week out, it's in a it's in a, it's in a uh, work-ready buffer that says, here's a whole selection of tasks that, in fact, actually could be started right now. Pick the one that you want. So that's, that's, a, that's his depiction of, of his six-week uh, master schedule activities uh, and how they come down into week one where they are workable backlog. And, and part of what that means is if something enters uh, – the look-ahead buffer in, in week six, uh, people are immediately asking, uh, are all the requisite uh, enabling capabilities available? And if not, let's expedite, expedite them. And as it moves forward, if it doesn't, you know, if, if, if some things happen that uh, says this, this thing can't go forward any further, it may get pushed out of this buffer completely. Okay, so here we've got... Uh, the depiction of, of what he's doing. He's dealing with uh, look-ahead schedules, uh, buffer backlogs, and today's task, or, you know, that's, that's plural, of course. And what he's doing is manipulating uh, modules in these pools, configuring them into uh, systems of interest uh, according to a passive infrastructure that has very strong requirements about definition, soundness, sequence, and size, and some key practices up there in, in uh, who is actively always involved in making sure the module mix is right, the modules are ready, assembling the systems of, of work tasks in this case, uh, and evolving the infrastructure. So we, we talk about uh, 10 principles behind the architecture. We call them the RRS principles or reconfigurable, reusable, reconfigurable, and scalable. Uh, but two of these are absolutely necessary, encapsulated modules evolving minimal standards. The other eight, uh, much like what you see in, in uh, agile software development and, and uh, some other things perhaps in Lean where you see a large number of principles, 
Uh, all principles, I mean, if, what if one of them isn't followed? Does, does that destroy your lean or your agile uh, capability? Not necessarily. Uh, but those principles are put, in this case, uh, they are put here because they amplify greatly how agile the system can be. We aren't going to deal with those. Uh, okay, now we'll move to a case study uh, that happened in uh, Malaysia. It was a semiconductor foundry, virtually the first one in Malaysia. This is a billion and a half dollar startup. Uh, it was October 1999 that started, and, and this was just when the internet was starting to make inroads into business. PDAs were just coming out. Uh, a, a very technologically accelerating environment, uh, mixed cultures to deal with. Uh, most of them uh, were really, well, Malaysia went through a period of having to put some very onerous uh, laws into effect in order to cut down on the battles between the Malay, the Chinese, and the Indian. Uh, and so it was a very strange environment in that sense. New company, uh, we thought, boy, what an opportunity. I mean, the president decided he wanted an agile capability, especially an ERP, because he had come out of an environment for many years where they had an SAP ERP uh, installation, and he was constantly being told, you can't change that. You can't change that. Uh, his attitude was, uh, okay, so I'm having to run my business like somebody 15 years ago in another country figured out how to run my business. He said, I don't want that. Uh, I know technology is changing fast. I know I have to give every one of my department managers responsibility for performance, and therefore he has to have authority to have anything he wants in place, and I'm not going to saddle him with an ERP system that tells him how he has to do business. Uh, okay, objectives. Uh, I'm not going to read through all these, but basically, you know, he was he was looking at uh, this foundry going into Malaysia as only the first of many to come, uh, and also to expand the business, not, not just in the, in the a foundry is what makes the 45 RPM record-looking or cd size looking uh, disks that have a whole bunch of integrated circuits on them. That's what a foundry does. Uh, then somebody else cuts them up, uh, tests them, uh, packages them, and he was also expend expecting to uh, expand his business into the assembly and test area by acquisition mainly. Okay, so he had he – had, uh, interesting requirements for an agile capability. General strategy, we had a group of people called business system analysts. We had another group of people called strategic system analysts. Uh, strategic system analysts were basically, it was a three-man team with, a, with rotating membership on a yearly basis, uh, and they were the ones responsible for the evolution of the infrastructure framework, the rules. Uh, the business system analysts uh, were basically IT people assigned into every single department uh, as people that would come to understand the business processes in that department from an IT perspective and understand the tool bases available in the industry. Uh, user collaboration, uh, we required mandatory response situation analysis by uh, all of the parties involved here as, as well as the department managers in terms of understanding uh, what kind of, of situations will you have to respond to in general? Uh, we also had a strong rule. Uh, COTS applications. We were, we were going to build an ERP system that had nothing but common off-the-shelf pieces. No, I shouldn't say nothing but. What I should say is that anything that bought could not be customized uh, because we understood that once you start customizing ERP modules, well, you have a heck of a time uh, dealing with the upgrades thereafter. Very expensive, uh, at least. And uh, IT, not to be outsourced, was the management of the infrastructure and design of the infrastructure. But all of the impl implementation work could be outsourced. This is, this is how that system looked. Uh, we used an enterprise, uh, an enterprise bus, which was a new concept back in the end of the 90s, early 2000, uh, with XML. And we basically said that anything on this bus that wanted to communicate, well, I should say anything in the IT environment that wants to communicate with anything else must and only can do so through the enterprise bus, and it must translate its, uh, its language into a common XML Esperanto 
they get untranslated by wherever its destination is. And that may seem like an expense, but, uh, but in fact, it saves a lot of money because you only have to do those translators once, and now everybody can talk to anybody at any time. Uh, okay. I'm not going to read through these, but this, this is how those RRS principles applied uh, in that environment. And again, right on top are the evolving minimal standards and encapsulated modules that were the key point. Okay, so now in terms of actually building, developing that system, uh, we had a set, you know, that, that is the process, uh, process we view as a system also. And so we said, how can we go develop that system with an agile development process? Uh, and these were, these were the principal rules that we used. We said we're going to do it in three phases. We're going to tell whoever gets selected as, uh, as ERP vendors, plural, that the first thing uh, they do, uh, they don't have to get any requirements from us. They've done this before for semiconductor companies. They can give us an out-of-the-box solution, and we'll take it, and we'll run with it. That's phase one. But while they're doing that, we're going to figure out uh, what kind of business process we think we'd like to have here in, this, in whatever department we're interested in. Uh, and after uh, phase one comes live, then we're going to start reconfiguring the environment for phase two, which is what we think it ought to be. And when we cut that over uh, at the end of 90 days, uh, a phase three will basically be uh, lessons learned from both environments and what should we really have out of all of this. And the, and the key thing there is that uh, phase one started when we had a set of requirements and no requirement was allowed to change until that was installed and operating. Then phase two had a new set of requirements, and no requirement was allowed to change while that was being installed. And then phase three, same same concept. Look more or less like this. We had what we called the template version, then the alpha version, and the beta version. Uh, and it was designed to accommodate requirements evolution, but not the chaos that typically happens in an ERP installation where requirements are changing daily. Okay, again, I'm not going to read through these. Uh, they are there. If, if anybody has an interest in, in reviewing this presentation and, and seeing more detail. Uh, the result was effective predictability. I mean, we actually did this. Three months functional ERP. The company was running in three months on an ERP system from scratch. Uh, three months later, we had phase two cutover. Three months later, we had phase three cutover. Uh, and it involved uh, human resource capability, decks of planners, existing time and attendance systems, as, as well as a majority of the ERP that's, that's not listed down below uh, from a single vendor, uh, Oracle. Uh, these were some of the performance metrics. Uh, long and short of the story is on time, on budget, on spec, uh, and, and much less time than the vendors were saying were the typical installation times, much less cost than the vendors were saying was the typical ratio between licensing the software and installation costs. So here's, here's all of that, uh, the development process put into that architectural diagram, uh, relating back into the slides that we've just looked at. Uh, here's the operational environment, uh, same thing put back into those concepts that we just looked at in this architectural concept diagram. Okay, so Agile Software Development, uh, ASD, uh, capital A on Agile, it's a branded software development process. Yes, there are varieties with, within that, within what is called Agile Software, there's XP, there's Scrum, there's a variety of other things. Uh, but the point I'm making here is you need to understand capital A Agile branded software development process is not the same as lowercase a Agile, a dictionary defined capability and property. And, and it's that lowercase a that, that uh, I'm focused on in this presentation and in, in all of the work that we'll be doing in, in our uh, working group on COSI, uh, trying to understand what makes things Agile. Uh, and, and not getting lost in the dogma of somebody's favorite way of doing things. Uh, and and uh, worth mentioning right now is 
is uh, in the Agile software development community, which is sizable and has benefit of uh, what some some uh, 2001 was when the manifesto came out. So let's say roughly 10 years of very avid uh, progress and many practitioners with many different ideas relatively uh, common in some aspects that allow them to call themselves agile software development. Uh, they're doing some very interesting work and, and now, as uh, somebody says, uh, maybe we need to think about some of this new lean thinking uh, and just to give a taste. Well, here's the agile software development process in general. Uh, you know, you've got a variety of different modules up there, components. You've got uh, a variety of responsible parties involved in this. Uh, typically, the Agile software development process deals with iterations. You know, let's build something, see how it works, and figure out what we ought to do next based on the results of what we just did. Uh, you know, under the umbrella of, of uh, some uh, expected progression toward uh, finality. Uh, the, the four infrastructure elements I put down at the bottom there uh, are arguable as to uh, what ought to be there. Uh, and instead of getting involved in the argument, I just borrowed the four abstractions that Baum and Turner did in their 2004 book, which was an excellent book that dealt with uh, agile concepts and, and uh, disciplined concepts and how the two uh, can mix and, and where the two have problems. Uh, but uh, basically their conclusion was those four things at the bottom are what's common across virtually all the different Agile processes. You will find other people with different lists. It doesn't matter. The concept here is, is that settle on your variety, understand what you have to put there, and that's how you run your processes. Okay, so now we come in uh, with some of the lean inroads here. Uh, this is an excellent, I recommend it, uh, video. Uh, titled Lean Startup, Why It Rocks Far More Than Agile Development. And uh, his contention, Agile has reached middle, middle aged and uh, you know, we've all had experience now with 10 years of these processes and lo and behold, it's, it's got some problems that we've come to understand. And so let's go lean. Uh, and uh, I'm not gonna read through all of this, but, but uh, basically you know, he's on a roll and uh, he did some interesting comparisons here using uh, the XP process for Agile mainly. Uh, he's likening this uh, whole concept of lean startup, as he calls it, uh, to Agile Software Development 2.0. And I, for one, believe that it's time for a 2.0. Uh, I also believe that uh, some of what we can learn from lean needs to be folded into Agile as validly part of, of Agile 2.0. But if you really look closely at uh, Joshua's focus, he's focused very much on, uh, you'll see it down at the bottom here, successful entrepreneurs. Uh, he's looking at people coming to market with uh, products in, in uh, environments not of the size of uh, defense contractors, for sure. Uh, and so I'll give him validity in lots of spaces, but he needs to understand where it's not valid. Uh, okay, here's some comments that, that I posted uh, in the uh, Agile Systems Engineering Forum that's uh, up in LinkedIn. Uh, and, and part of some of the discussion uh, started to center on uh, Lean and Agile and, and uh, where are they complementary? Uh, where are they in conflict? Are they complementary? Are they in conflict? Uh, and, and there's a, a variety of thought out there. And these, were, these were some of the things I had to say about Joshua's approach, and, and I applaud it. I think it is time to look at the traditional Agile software development thing uh, and lean it out. But hear me when I say this. Agile software development is a very small area of Agile systems and Agile concepts. Uh, it happens to be consistent with the fundamental architecture. That goes from biology and complex systems. Okay, so 
everything I've shown you are just a few cases from a very large body of knowledge of studied systems that exhibit those characteristics. Uh, and, and those characteristics basically got boiled down from looking at all those systems. And, and that was all nice, but those were all man-made systems. And, and then all of a sudden, uh, recently, we come to understand where they're echoed in biology. Uh, excellent work done here uh, in something called the bow tie pattern. John Doyle uh, has written extensively on this and, and uh, done a lot of work with Gene Carlson, Mary Set. Uh, excellent work on understanding how uh, a very small knot in the center of the bow tie can enable an extremely large capability on the right-hand side uh, by using uh, a very large variety uh, of potential inputs. Uh, a, a simple, stupid example, uh, this concept of money, you know, because there was a time when there was no money. And if you wanted something, you had to find somebody who produced it, and you had to negotiate a trade with what you could produce. Uh, and every time you wanted something, you had a new negotiation to go through. Money changed all that. Uh, it, it gave a very uh, common reduction so that uh, you didn't have to find somebody who wanted what you had in order for you to get what he had. Uh, anyway, we see this in the uh, bow tie pattern in the immune system. Doyle and, and company have have shown this bow tie pattern in dozens of systems, the Internet being one for, for sure. But in this case, we see uh, the immune system uh, with an extremely high variety of DNA potential has a little library, and this is true. It's got uh, three libraries, one with 120 pieces in it, one with 27 pieces in it, one with six pieces in it. It's got a protocol that says grab one from each library, stick a few random nucleotides in between them, and ship it out as a potential detector for an invading uh, antigen. And so it makes an extremely large variety of detectors for things it's never seen before with a very few simple rules and a very small library of modules. And, and this is reducing all of that in, into the diagram that we looked at. Uh, okay, so here's some more work by uh, Seton Doyle. They basically deal with what I've been calling passive infrastructure. They call it protocols. And they make an interesting uh, argument and, and uh, things worth knowing about the importance of the infrastructure is much larger than the importance of the modules that you select up there. And, and uh, we're running out of time. I'm not going to spend much time on this, but I highly recommend for those of interest uh, these documents that I've referenced here, wrapping it up. Uh, when we teach students uh, agile systems and agile systems engineering concepts at the fundamental level, there are, as I mentioned before, seven basic thought guiding tools we use, uh, plus an eighth that I throw up here, which is I make them all write a story. Uh, they're going to, you know, select the system you're going to work on, uh, you're going to design, and tell me what it looks like after it's already built, it's been in use for two years. Walk me through the gears. That's your projected operational story. And then you go around the circle and you make the rest of it happen. We focused only on that, that uh, architectural concept with responsibilities, which I'll call integrity, uh, with a little bit of the RRS in there. Fundamentally, I showed this before, uh, metrics for how you measure response capability. And very important to understand, you can't reduce this and say, oh, you're just talking about modular systems. Uh, modular systems aren't necessarily agile at all. Risk and uncertainty management through creation of drag and drop response options, enabling effective plug and play use of those options, and management, sustained management of those enabling characteristics. Those are three fundamental requirements. Okay, so you saw the bones of what an agile system has. Uh, and in parting, we've got a new group starting up. It will have its kickoff at IW13. Uh, if you're interested in being on the announcement list so you can decide later or whenever, uh, if you want to show up and be a part, uh, send me an email uh, and say 
what you want. Do you want to be on the general announcements list? Uh, do you want to have access to the SharePoint site, which won't be up till Q4? And do you want to read the group charter? You may want some of these, not all of these. Uh, here's references that support uh, what's been said throughout, and I guess we're done. Okay. Questions? I guess Rick, I'm thank you for a great presentation on agile systems and processes, necessary and sufficient fundamental architecture. Now, can you look out over the questions that have been posed by the audience in the Q&A? If you open up Q&A and click on the Manage tab, you'll see the questions there. Click on any one question to highlight it. Okay, Randy has asked, could you show the URL for the presentation again? Uh, I will do that. Uh, how the heck? Do that. <laughs> well, first I do that. Then I do this, and I go there. And I go there. Okay, it's uh, download this seminar. There it is down at the bottom of the page. I'll leave that there for a while while I look at the next question. Actually, Rick. Would it be okay if I took a copy of that and posted it on the Incosi website with the webinar? We have a presentation file there, and if you'd be okay, I could include that for people to reference later. I have no problem. Uh, the only value here is I update this this one asynchronously, as I say. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Let's see. We got we got uh, Dean. Dean D, what are the measures of effectiveness and suitability for describing agility in a system or process? What are the measures of effectiveness? Uh, well, we, I, I showed those metrics. Uh, basically said what we're talking about uh, is responding in an uncertain environment, which is to say we're, we're not talking about a flexible system that has a canned response. You, know? uh, you can have anything you want as long as one of these ten varieties. Uh, your response is going to be uh, reconfigured from fundamental resources on the fly to fit the situation need. And so what we're interested uh, in measuring the effectiveness of that response is, can you do it fast enough? Uh, and I stress fast enough. Can you do it fast enough so that you can deal with the situation that requires a response? And the next metric uh, for effectiveness is, uh, can you do it often? I mean, I should say, can you afford to do this often? Or did you brute force and make everybody work overtime for you know, the next three months in order to finally respond to this thing? Uh, and you can't afford to do that again this year. The budget won't allow it. So the cost of your, cap of your ability to respond is very much a part of the effectiveness. Uh, the next one uh, we call uh, quality or predictability because basically it's, you know we're, we're looking at predictability uh, as the quality issue for response. Can you really do it? One of the issues that we had when we examined things in the automotive industry back in the early 90s, uh, when they when they have have to bring out a new model car, what they do is they send home in the factory, you're going to build this car, they send home all the workers, first of December, they bring in another group of people to gut the plant and put in new equipment, uh, they start up January 1, they bring all the workers back and they say, okay, now produce as many cars this month as you did, you know, in the month of November, but these guys are all working with brand new equipment, uh, in some cases with new process, uh, with uh, new resources they got to build cars out of, and they do. They make just as many cars as they used to, except a large percentage of them end up in the rework lot, and they don't get delivered anywhere. But they were able to say, and we got it done on time. So that's why we have this third concept of, of on time, on budget, on spec, predictability. Is your response capability predictable? Uh, and the final effectiveness one is, do you have scope? I mean, if, if all you can do is respond within 10% of what you're currently doing uh, to uh, you know, a situation that's changed only about 10%, uh, we, don't, we don't think in general that that's sufficient 
uh, you ought to have a much larger range of response capability, and, and we basically call that scope, scope of response. Uh, now, in reality, uh, what we say is you only have to be uh, agile effectively within your mission. If your mission is, is very narrowly defined, uh, or I should say has very narrow parameters on, in, on its ability to uh, face different situations, then maybe 10% uh, is enough. But in general, that's not, that's not what we've looked for. Uh, Gene, I don't know if that answered your question the, the way you had meant it, but uh, I hope so. Uh, okay, now we have Paul. Paul Friends. Please give whatever. Okay, I already did that, Paul, right? Uh, then we have Francine Barno, uh, who's got a name up there, but no question selected. And we've got Bo Oppenheim, Mr. Lean. Are the four Agile values and 12 Agile principles that originated in software still guiding the Agile world? Uh, well, when you say the Agile world, uh, Bo, you have correctly capitalized it because you're were, you were really very specifically speaking to the Agile software development world, uh, which is, which is uh, parochial in some sense and that they're only focused on software development. Uh, and and uh, the, the four Agile values, which came out of their manifesto, uh, very much, as I see it right now, guide uh, all of those different varieties of, of uh, Agile software development approaches. And I might, I might uh, make the point that Many of the Agile values and Agile principles are really focused on people and how they interact. Uh, now, when you talk about the 12 Agile principles that originated in software, are they still, are they still, what are we saying, uh, still guiding the Agile world? Uh, I would say in general the answer has to be yes, but I would say more specifically what I showed you with, with this uh, Joshua, whatever his last name was, guy, uh, that's, that's starting to push Lean Startup, he calls it, and, and Lean something else is Agile 2.0. Uh, he's starting to put focus in very different, very different places. Uh, his, his principal focus is how fast can we get to market and make money, uh, as I read it, okay, and I think uh, he is introducing a new set of principles, some with overlap and some that are different and some that have dropped what have been there originally. Uh, and it's, it's hard to say, are the four Agile values and 12 principles still guiding the Agile world? In general, I have to say yes. Uh, but keep in mind that they're focused on software development issues and the nature of the world of programmers trying to uh, deliver software that's going to make someone happy. Can you put up the references one more time? Uh, yeah, but let me go to the next one first. Rick, you may, you may see some interesting interconnections with another bow tie. On that class more. Since feedback is fundamental to Agile systems, what organizational culture changes do you see as necessary to make this happen in a highly hierarchical uh, You just ask a uh, consulting project question here, I think. Uh, Rick, I think we're out of time, so uh, perhaps you can take that off offline with Mary. Yeah. Uh, Mary, you've got my you've got my email address. Uh, somebody wanted the references put up. Here they are. Okay, out of time. Here we are. Well, thank you again, Rick, uh, for a great talk, and thank you to the audience for your questions and your time. The next slide shows our upcoming schedule. The next webinar will be held on Wednesday, the 17th of October, 2012, when Bjorn Cole will give a presentation on Inkosi CubeSat Challenge Team.
experiences with, with collaborative modeling of an operational satellite and progress towards seeding a CubeSat development kit. This will be followed on 21st of November 2012 by Art Peister presenting on Bookcase version 1. As in the past, webinars will be scheduled for the third Wednesday of every month through 2012 and into 2013. Please note that if you go to the website shown here, you'll see more information about the webinar series, including a way to view the previous webinars, and soon this webinar as well. I want to draw your attention to the INCOSI certification program, which was the subject of the 41st INCOSI webinar on 18th of April 2012. This slide shows the, oh, jumped over it, the different certification categories. Uh, and associated qualification requirements. The next two slides show you where to find information on the certification program on the INCOSI website.